welcome to Bed Crime Stories podcast. I'm your host, T. If you like all things true crime, if you like it delivered in a peaceful, tranquil manner, if you like it clear and concise without drama, then I highly recommend you subscribe. And if you like what you hear, please smash the like button. It's a free way you can help. And now, without further ado, let's dig in. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Have you guys heard the interview that Chris and Katie Proudfoot did on a YouTube channel called Duchess? Apparently, the interview was done seven days after the Proudfoots reported Sebastian missing. When I first looked at the video, it looked like it had been posted two months ago, and I think it was. That led me to believe that the interview took place one month into Sebastian's disappearance. But as I listened to it, it became clear that the interview actually was taking place seven days after Chris and Katie reported Sebastian missing. So this would actually be the first interview that they did. Their first interview with the media took place the day after this interview, from what I can tell. And the Chronicles of Olivia interview took place on March 18th. I wanted to share some sound bites from this interview. Note that Chris and Katie did not show their faces, so it was just voices. And I'll leave a link to the Duchess channel and to this video in particular in the description, just in case you haven't listened to the whole thing. What I want you to listen for is the emotion in Katie Proudfoot's voice at various points. So if this was seven days after Sebastian went missing, it should have been very raw for her. And at places in this interview, she does sound like she's crying and she's deeply upset. Chris Proudfoot, on the other hand, is cool as a cucumber. He's very detached. And the wording he uses to refer to Katie and to Sebastian is very interesting. I also noticed that Katie wanted to say things about Sebastian, positive things about him at various points, but either Chris or the interviewer Duchess talks over Katie, so we can't hear what she's saying, and it's pretty maddening because obviously Katie Proudfoot as supposedly the last person who was with Sebastian, her experiences and what she has to say are critically important. Let's begin. So I guess I will just kind of start out with, um, tell me what happened the day that Sebastian went missing. I know that his mom said that he was having a good day. He had had a great weekend. So do you want to walk us through what that looks like again? for everybody? Um, He did have a really good weekend, actually. Um, When we come home from having supper that evening, um, he was playing. Mm -hmm. Uh, When he went to bed, when I told him to go to bed, um, he had even, he said, I love you, mama. And he said, I love you, puppies. Um, a little later in the evening, I myself went to bed, and uh, when I went to wake him up for school, he wasn't here. Did you hear Katie say about Sebastian, quote, he was playing when he went to bed, when I told him to go to bed. So she catches herself there. She says, when he went to bed, and then she quickly changes it to, when I told him to go to bed. She also says a little later, I myself went to bed. So I do feel like she caught herself and that perhaps she had deviated from a narrative, maybe, that she and Chris had put together. And one of the details was that she told him to go to bed. What I also found interesting is that she does not say the times that these things occurred. Now, after I listened to the full interview, I realized 
that she had shared times with this duchess person before they sat down for this recorded chat. But it takes duchess later to bring those specific details into the conversation. And uh, when I went to wake him up for school, he wasn't here. And you did tell me that Sebastian is not a runner. He's not. It's okay. Take your time. Sebastian does not have a history of running. He, he, I mean, the young man doesn't go outside very much. I mean, everybody in the neighborhood knows him. Um, he is very um, to himself, so to speak. Um, between the hours of you know, 12 and 6, he, he has basically vanished. Walked out of the house, the door was locked, and gone. Did you hear how Chris referred to Sebastian as the young man? He also said the young man doesn't go outside. So now why would he walk out that door that night when in this interview, Chris says he doesn't go outside all that much? We heard in other interviews that he was barefoot. He hates to go outside barefoot. He also is terrified of insects and he doesn't like to get dirty. It makes no sense that Sebastian would, on his own accord, walk out that door. I'll say it again and again and again. And the Proudfoots are basically telling us the same thing when they talk about his personality. Take the phone. None of his shoes are missing. Now, you told me that night that, now, Chris, you were at work. You were out of town at work. Yes, so you were not even home. Correct, ma'am. And mom, you uh, fell asleep on the couch about I'm 10 o'clock, but you said that Sebastian went to bed at 9 p.m., and then you got up off the couch and you went to bed and you said that was around midnight. Midnight. And, and nothing was unusual at that point. Everything so, seemed okay. There's actually a piece of... So to make something very crystal clear, so that okay. way there's transparency across the board. Me and the mom were on the phone at 9.43 or 9.46 in the evening. We stayed on the phone for quite some time. The call logs have been verified by all the police departments, TBI included. Uh, we stayed on the phone, it was very lengthy. Mom did slightly start falling asleep while she was on the couch. Um, I had said, hey, you need to wake up, put the dogs up, go to bed. Uh, now mind you, that was right around midnight, just before midnight or right around midnight. So there's no mention of a thud or any kind of noise at 10 p.m. During this interview, also, Chris refers to Katie as the mom. Very detached, very distant, and conveniently, he makes it known that he was away at work. It's almost like he's gleeful because he was nowhere near the alleged crime scene. It is also very interesting that Katie does not mention being on the phone with Chris for like three hours. Only he later brings that into the narrative. It's like she forgot about that detail. How do you forget about a three-hour phone call on the night that your son vanished? And Chris sets the timeline for the disappearance. He says it happened sometime between midnight and Katie went to bed and 6 a.m. when she woke up and went to get Sebastian and wake him up. And I know that a lot of you have said and questioned, how does Chris know when he wasn't even there? How can he be so sure of all these things? And if Sebastian went to bed at 9 and there was no noise and nothing happened and she went to bed at midnight, how do they know that Sebastian disappeared somewhere between midnight and and six, is that why they say that Katie fell asleep on the sofa? Because she would have been downstairs looking at that front door or near that front door, and therefore Sebastian could not have come out of his bedroom and walked out the front door until she went to bed at midnight. Because I'll tell you what, number one, I never have three hour conversations with my husband, like ever whether it's during the day or at night. 
And if I were to have a three-hour conversation late at night, I would do it from the comfort of my bed. Why is Katie on the couch and not in bed? Is that an important detail? Because they have to make it seem like Sebastian could not have walked out the front door until midnight. What prevented him from leaving, say, after 9 p.m. when he went to bed. They're saying they don't know what happened to him, so why have they ruled out that he left somewhere between 9 and 11 p.m. maybe? So then mom go to bed and wake up early in the morning to go wake her son up and get him ready for school. And now we have a worried mom who can't find her son in the house. Um, Mom made an effort to look and search several times. Um, Mom has called me at the time and asked me. She was like, I can't find him. I was like, do what? And she goes, yeah, I cannot find him. I said, well, then hang on. I made the phone call and reported it to the sheriff's department because that's what we're supposed to do. And within 10 minutes, the sheriffs were dispatched to the location. As Chris is telling the story, he pauses a lot. It's like he has to try to recall what he's going to say next. That's not how things flow when somebody is telling the truth. It flows naturally. You don't have to hesitate. It's all there because the truth is the truth and there's no need to think about it. And why is he telling all this part of the story when he wasn't even there? Katie should be the one giving that account. I feel like this is Chris's story because Chris is the person who made it up. Allegedly, just my opinion, I'm speculating. And again, he's very detached. He's referring to Katie as the mom or mom. He refers to Sebastian as her son, not our son. This our son stuff is something that Chris has learned over the past three months from criticism. So he's adapting in my opinion, allegedly. And you had told me that there hadn't been any particular situation that had occurred where you felt like there would have been something that happened. And I also had asked you if there were any friends that Sebastian might have possibly left the house with, or if he had any contact with anyone on social media. Do you want to comment about that again? He doesn't have a social media. Um, okay. And the only friends that he had were a couple of kids in school. Okay. Um, all the kids that have had any interaction with him have been interviewed and asked. Okay. We, we as parents um, know how social media can be. Right. And seeing how kids can be easily manipulated. Um, He's very young in mind. Yes, he may be. He's about 15 and he's 15 in age in his body, but his mind is not caught up to his body. Um, but that is something that goes through with autistic children, as everybody would know. Right. Um, but for the record, we I am a very strict parent. I do. He does not have social media, not in our household. He doesn't uh, online game. He. I mean, I am. I'm pretty strict when it comes to that kind of situation. Well, that's good. That's good, Chris, that, that you have control of that because social media can be very dangerous for young kids um, because they don't realize who they may be talking to on social media. So it's always good to have that awareness and to make sure you're monitoring, you know, what your kids are doing. So I had asked you both, you know, did you have any idea what would make Sebastian want to suddenly leave the house? And you told me, well, that's the million dollar question that everybody wants to know. All the detectives, they've all asked that same question. What is it that happened that caused him to leave the house? Um, and I know you must be so worried and so concerned. Is there anything, if, if Sebastian were listening to this live stream right now, if you knew that he was out there, what would you want to tell him? That we love you and to come home. I mean, it's pretty simple. This boy has a very large family that 
everybody is asking the question, where are you? We love you and please come home. You notice how Duchess has to be the one to say, I'm sure you're very worried. Katie and Chris don't say that. They don't say, we don't know where he is. We don't know if he's safe. We don't know if he has anything to eat. We don't know if he's afraid. Duchess also has to prompt Katie and Chris to address Sebastian just in case he's out there somewhere listening. We've heard from experts that parents with missing children don't need to be prompted to do this. This is something that's automatic. It comes out of them the minute they're in front of the media. So Duchess has enough sense to prompt them to do these things because she's probably seen parents of missing children before. And she knows what they typically say when they're handed a microphone. We also hear them saying that although Sebastian is 15 in age and body, mentally he's much younger, that has been a consistent message from all the parents, from Seth Rogers, the biological father, and Katie and Chris Proudfoot. We definitely need to find him as soon as possible. If you live in this area, please search your property every day. He could be on the move. Just because you've already searched your property one time doesn't mean that you don't need to continue to search your property on a daily basis just to be sure if you have a lot of land it needs to be searched you know just to be sure because he may be lost he may be somewhere and he doesn't he can't find his way back so that's why it's very critical can you talk to me about the search and rescue efforts are they searching on land air there also have dive teams there what can you tell us about that so currently um they as of today the national guard was also brought in to help with the search but they have had fixed wing aircraft helicopters um horseback atv side by side um door to door scouring every neighborhood possible um i mean the outreach from the community and various counties has been extremely welcoming loved i mean it, it's we've been told this is probably one of the largest searches that they've conducted with so much input that it, it's it's a case to be studied for sure to me chris saying that this is a case to be studied it's almost like he's proud of it maybe he is the mastermind of the perfect crime allegedly in my opinion i'm just saying it's a weird thing to say seven days out and obviously chris is not too emotionally worked up over sebastian's disappearance there is no hint of emotion there are no tears flowing from him. Again, he is very detached when he's talking about Sebastian and also when he's talking about Katie and her son. A lot of people that are praying and supporting you right now. Was his ask, would he be able to ride a city bus? Um, nothing is off the table as far as abilities. The young man get on a bus, I'm sure he could. We've never done it before. We've never rode a city bus, so I don't think he understands the process. Um, he doesn't have any uh, sense of money. He may have like, let's say a $20 bill in his hand, but he doesn't truly understand what $20 would get him. He's good right. at this, but he doesn't I understand, understand. Um, and money. Did you hear Katie try to pipe in that he's good at math, Sebastian is good at math, but he doesn't understand time and money. And single mom says, does he want his real father? Maybe I'm just asking. Well, it turns out single mom that, you know, he sees his real father every other weekend and uh, the real father, uh, he is heavily involved in this situation and is aware and he doesn't know where Sebastian is either, correct? Correct. I mean, I can tell you this. His father's very much involved in his life. Yes, very much involved in his life. The relationship between all three of us as parents is not your common one. I mean, me and the father talk on a regular basis. We call each other. We talk, hey, if we heard anything, how's he doing? Is he acting up? Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's not, there's no really animosity in between 
the parents. That's a lie. We know there is animosity between Seth Rogers and Katie Proudfoot and Chris Proudfoot. Katie is very angry with Seth and she has been for a long time. It's not just since Sebastian went missing. We know from the divorce papers that there's a lot of animosity and a lot of accusations. And Chris depicting their relationship as the three parents being so unusual and not common, implying that it's such a great relationship. Well, that's just not true because Seth Rogers has said he was unaware of the CPS reports that were made on the Proudfoot home. So there was a lack of honesty between these three people. Seth only found out about those reports after Sebastian went missing. So Chris is not portraying the relationship in an authentic and honest manner. He's sugarcoating it. Why is he doing that? Why does he have a need to make the relationship between the two households look better than it is? They say, did he have any special interest like trains, parks, friends, maybe a school bus route that he loved? My son elopes and loves trains, so he heads to the tracks. He loves um, playgrounds. Yeah, he loves playgrounds. I mean, he, he loves to play. I give him that. Um, friends wise she wants friends sebastian his idea of his friend is right now is what he has two kids that he talks to at school but he is extremely socially awkward and so it's very difficult for him to make friends uh which has been this boy's only lifelong dream if i mean he, he christmas what do you want for christmas i want friends birthday i want friends Anything that he could do to get a friend, he would love to do it, which is potentially dangerous because that could open up doors if for somebody to say, hey, I'll be your friend and potentially cause harm. Did you hear Chris say he loves to play? I'll give him that. Like, that's the only positive thing he can say about Sebastian. I'll give him that much. He then goes on to describe how socially awkward Sebastian is. Well, we've been hearing different stories that he did have some friends at school. It is very sad to hear that he asked repeatedly for friends, but is that true? And is that the only thing that he wanted? Did he maybe also want a kind and patient stepfather who perhaps wasn't so strict, wasn't so mean-spirited, allegedly, who maybe really did cultivate a love for him. We know he wanted to get some cats to replace the ones that he had to get rid of when his mother decided to marry Chris Proudfoot. Kim Holmes asked if there's any cameras in the area and I did see Kim that they were asking for people that had any ring doorbell footage or any businesses that had camera footage. Talk to us about that Chris. We did speak about that briefly earlier about the people getting all the footage but they haven't found anything. Um, our entire neighborhood and surrounding neighborhoods have voluntarily and with generosity given up any video footage that they have they've they've got i mean they have let the 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 departments come in and view and monitor um so as far as cameras everybody has turned over everything there's thousands of hours of stuff that they are combing through to try to find an answer i'm hoping that law enforcement is still going through all that footage and that perhaps maybe there still is something that they haven't yet seen that will lead to answers you know i'm also finding it interesting that when katie was seemingly crying we don't hear chris say anything like oh honey you know like showing compassion for her tears realizing that she could probably use a hug in that moment i know if my husband was sitting next to me and i was crying about a family member who's missing especially a child he would be saying oh honey it's gonna be okay you know we're gonna find him not just sitting there and being all businesslike it's sort of like in these moments katie is experiencing pain at the loss of Sebastian. But Chris is not. He's just there to tell the story. He probably knows the route to his father's house, so maybe he was in the process of heading in that direction. Is that that has, yeah, that has not been ruled out. Um, I mean, like I said, the search that they are conducting is extremely widespread and thorough. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so nobody is ruling that out as a possibility. But normally when he wants to go to his dad's, he just says so. And we just call his dad. Yeah, I mean, it's dad will come down here. We meet him halfway. I mean, there's... this. He's never wanted to go to his dad's and not been able to go. Let's put it that way. Right. I mean, thank you, thank you for being a member for six months. Um, the, all of this is very, very helpful to help us, you know, better understand the situation that we're dealing with. Did you hear Katie try to say something? She says, I mean, he, and then Duchess cuts her off. That's really unfortunate because we want to let Katie say everything she wants to say. Don't cut her off. Let her roll with it. Listen to that one more time. I mean, Thank you. Thank you for being a member for six months. I mean, what did she want to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank her later for being a member for six months. Facebook that it looked like everybody was asked to wear green on Friday because green is Sebastian's favorite color. Um, what else can you tell us about Sebastian? Um, this is an avid Minecraft fan. Um, loves the color green. Um, it's got the goof, the goofiest and quirky smile in the world. I, I don't think I don't think anybody could could um, mimic it. To be honest with you, um, he looks like he's such a sweet young man. He um, loves to dance. That boy can he'll dance his tail off. That's hey, sure. that's there's nothing wrong with that. Dancing is good for you. It's good exercise too. What Chris can tell us about Sebastian appears to be very limited. He always mentions the Minecraft thing. Then he repeats that Sebastian's favorite color is green. Duchess just said that. You can't come up with anything other than that, Chris. And by the way, Katie got cut off here again. She tried to say something. Take a listen. Mimic it to be honest with you. Um, he looks like he's such a sweet young man. He, um... Did you hear Katie try to say he is, as in he is a sweet young man? Again, Duchess was trying to soften the way Chris was talking about Sebastian, having the goofiest and quirkiest smile. That's Chris making fun of Sebastian, and he's shading him there for having a goofy smile. He's got... Um... I just really hope they can find some answers. Now, I did ask you guys because, um, you know, I know that sometimes when we're looking for autistic children that go missing, a lot of times people are concerned that they may be attracted to go towards the water. So talk to us about that. Is he is he a good swimmer? Does he like to get in the water? I think you did mention some things about that to me earlier. Um, so... He, he he's a fish in the water. I'm gonna tell you right now that he, if there's a, if, but here's the distinction. He is not a child that likes to get dirty. He can't stand his hands dirty. He can't stand bugs. He is fearful of flies and things. So if he swims, he is a pool pool kid. He's not a I'm a river and a stream kind of kid. He is swimming pool bound. Duchess cut Katie off once again. Chris jumps in. And the way he talks about Sebastian is almost like, well, Sebastian's kind of a sissy. He only likes pools. You won't get him in a river or a pond. He hates being dirty. He doesn't like insects or flies. He's afraid of them. It's almost like he's painting him out to be something of a wimp. That's how it's coming across to me just my opinion. Personally, I get the feeling that Sebastian did not live up to Chris's expectations of what a male child should be like. He should be tough, want to go out and hunt, not be afraid of anything, take on not only flies and insects, but also bears. You know what I mean? Just my opinion. Now, I know that you said there was some misinformation that was going around <clears throat> and you wanted to make a clarification. You did tell me that TBI, uh, you know, was assisting, but that there was some confusion. People thought that FBI was actually assisting in this case. Talk to me about um, what you spoke about earlier to me on our phone call about how FBI is uh, that they were consulted um, and the card team um you know, was they were, I guess there is a discussion going on as to whether he qualifies um, 
as you know for the child abduction response yeah. team so he the fbi is not physically on the ground uh somewhere in, in one of the news clips i think it was reported that the fbi had made it on the ground they're not um tbi tennessee bureau of investigations has reached out to the behavioral analysis team or their cart team and they are trying to work with them from a distance not they're not physically present uh to help in, in any way form shape that they can render their assistance Okay. Chris does seem to know every detail of the case, who's on the ground, who's involved, when they're getting involved. He's keeping a very close watch on things for a guy who's very cool as a cucumber. Have burner phones been looked into? I know some teens sneak phones from their parents or maybe his computer use at school to we see if he has been checked. Evidence of a secret phone? Okay, good. Good. Because digital evidence is really important. They want to make sure that he's not speaking to anybody. This is such an unusual case. Um, this case is very extremely uh, unusual. Um, like I said before, we are pretty strict when it comes to certain things. Um, as far as comms, communication, electronic devices, mm -hmm. there was only one phone that he had. It was extremely locked down. He had access to his phone, his text message to only his contacts list, uh, a camera, and a calculator. And that is it. He's a pretty happy kid, usually. Did you hear Katie trying to get something in and Duchess talking over her again? But at some point, Katie does get to get her words out. And I'll admit here, I believe that Katie is showing sincere emotion here. I hear a lot of tears. I hear a lot of sadness in the background with her. Again, this interview took place either seven or eight days after Sebastian was reported missing. So this is very raw. This is very new to Katie. And I do feel like she's sad. Chris, not so much. In fact, not at all. Which does make me wonder if this was the ultimatum. Katie, it's either me or Sebastian. And because of that custody case over Chris's daughter, Faith, perhaps he said, I'm not waiting until the summer because of course, Seth Rogers was planning to take over as the full-time parent to Sebastian. And I know that you love him very much. I know that you, I can remember earlier in our conversation, you, you were referring to him as Bubba. And I that's think what that's I sweet. I think my son Bubba also, so that really tore my heartstrings because my son, he's 30, but he's still Bubba to me. So um, it just, that name is going to stick forever. It's just how it is. She does it again. Duchess cuts Katie off. Katie's trying to tell her story about Bubba. And instead, the hostess jumps in and has to tell us about her son, Bubba, who's still alive. This interview is supposed to be about Sebastian. Let Katie talk about Sebastian. Try not to cut her off. If you want to be Barbara Walters, take some notes. Do not cut your interviewee off right when they're about to say something. I'm sorry, I know Duchess is probably not a professional interviewer, but I'm saying it's frustrating. I want to hear what Katie has to say. And she's just getting drowned out between Duchess and Chris. I'm going to end it here. Let me know if you want me to continue with this particular interview. It's about an hour and 51 minutes long. Let me know in the comments. Smash that like button if you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time on Bed Crime Stories.